Question one, an analyst performs a regression of a stock's return on the overall market return using a sample of two years of monthly returns. Uh, he estimates the slope coefficient to be 0.55 with a standard error of 0.26. The analyst then performs a hypothesis test at 5% level of significance to determine if the slope coefficient is significantly different from zero. Um, so significantly different from zero, so that's gonna be a two-sided test. Which of the following correctly describes the test statistic and the result of this test? The test statistic is. Um, so we've got a few different, two different test statistics here, 0.47 and 2.12. And then our answers are we either reject the null um, or we don't reject the null. Um, so two steps here. First, we need to figure out what the critical value is. And to do that, we're gonna use, we need to find out our degrees of freedom. So our sample size is gonna be two years of monthly returns. So our N will be four, or sorry, not four, 24. And then since this is a different from zero, it's gonna be a two-sided test. Um, and so our degrees of freedom is gonna be um, 24 minus two, which would be 22 and then pair that with a two-tailed um, test, our T value is gonna be 22 degrees of freedom from the T table is 2.074. So we need to get our T statistic um, calculation and then what if that is greater than this, then we'll wanna reject the null. If it's less than the critical value, then we will not be able to reject the null. So here's what that calculation looks like. Um, so we've got um, our coefficient, slope coefficient 0.55 and then we're going to subtract that from what we want to test for which is zero and then we're going to just plug in that standard error which is given at 0.26 and we see we get 2.12 which is greater than 2.074 um, so we can rule out C and D right away since those don't have the right test statistic and then for A um, null hypothesis is rejected that's going to be correct to conclude that the slope coefficient is different from zero um, and then cannot be rejected. Um, if, the, if this is greater than the critical value, then we can reject. Um, so we'll go with A. Question two, which of the following cases most likely involve the mismanagement of hedging strategies? So we've got A, Enron. Um, Enron, this was a um, scandal where, um, which was accounting related, um, where essentially they were cooking the books and lying and manipulating their financial statements. Um, so not related to mismanagement of hedging. B, Volkswagen. This was a case study on um, really just on bad corporate culture. They called it Dieselgate, which comes uh, at its reputational risk, where essentially they were um, installed software that was allowing them to kind of uh, bypass emission standards without actually being up to the code on that. Um, and then we've got C, Metall Gesellschaft. Um, sorry if I butchered that pronunciation. So this is going to be our answer, um, and that's because it was the result of um, the mismatch between the company hedging long-term oil and gas contracts, and they were using um, short-term um, oil and gas futures. So essentially, the instruments they were using to hedge didn't um, line up, and so those... Um, price movements weren't uh, doing what they needed to for them. Uh, and then B, D, Barings Bank. So this is a case of one of their traders kind of going rogue and um, speculating big time um, to the point where they had uh, losses over twice the bank's available capital because of all the leverage he was using. Uh, so answer C here. Question three, First Republic entered into a two year interest rate swap on August 9th, 2020 in which it received a 5% fixed rate premised on an agreement to pay LIBOR plus 1.25 on a notional amount of USD 7.5 million. Payments were to be made every six months. The table below displays the actual um, annual six month LIBOR rates over the two year period. Um, so these are annual rates. Um, so assuming no default, how much did First Republic receive on August 9th, 2022? So August 9th, 2022, our LIBOR rate is 1.78. Um, the tricky part here though, is we're um, on August 9th, they receive what the swap rate was at the, previous, um, uh, at the previous reading was. So they're gonna receive 1.4% on August 9th, and then at the next one, they would receive this rate. Um, so here's how we go ahead and calculate this. Um, so we're going to have our floating rate that they had to pay was going to be 1.4 plus the 
uh, it's LIBOR plus 1.25, so LIBOR rate is 1.4. And then um, the fixed rate we're receiving is 5% up here, that's given. So the amount we're gonna receive is gonna be our notional, and then we're gonna multiply that by the spread between those two rates. But we do have to divide that spread by two since this is six month LIBOR. Um, and when we do out that math, we get 88,125, uh, which lines up right here with answer B. Question four, which of the following correctly describes a protective put? So a protective put, um, that's gonna consist of two legs to that position. So the put is going to be protecting your underlying position. Um, so we're gonna be buying a put, so we'll be long a put, meaning that if our shares go down, um, would that put will protect our underlying position. And then the other part of that position is gonna be long the stock. So um, basically we're long the stock so that if shares go up, we're, uh, we'll benefit, but if shares go down past a certain point, being our put strike price, um, we'll be protected, hence the name. Uh, so A, long position in a put option, good so far, and short position in the underlying shares, that's going to be no good. Um, if we're short the underlying shares and long uh, in the put, we're going to be double short, essentially. Um, so we can rule out A. B, long position in a put, good so far, while the underlying shares are held, that is also good so far. Um, so it looks like B is going to be our answer. C, short position in a put in long position in the underlying shares. That's gonna be double long. Um, being short in a put means we want shares to go up and long in the shares one means we want them to go up. Um, so that's that protective. And then short position in a put and short position in the underlying. Um, these are opposite positions. So we, in, in a short position in the put, we'd want them to go up. In a short position in the shares, we want it to go down. Um, but our short position in the put doesn't really protect us. Um, we're, if we're short in our put option, we're going to be forced to buy if we breach that. Um, we're collecting some premium, which helps with the downside a little bit, but it's not necessarily protective. Um, so we'll go with answer B. Question five. An investor purchases 20000 worth of stock using a margin account with an initial margin requirement of 50% and a maintenance margin requirement of 25%. So what this means so far is um, we have $20,000 worth of stock. We had to put up 50% of that as equity. So we put up $10,000 to buy this $20,000 worth of stock. And then on an ongoing basis, we need to keep, uh, make sure we stay above 5,000 essentially, or 25% of whatever this stock uh, moves to. What is the minimum amount that the investor must deposit into the margin account to meet the maintenance uh, margin requirement if the stock's value falls to 11,100? All right, so let's pull in um, how the math here and how this is gonna work. So our initial margin is 10,000, so our equity is also 10,000. So then next what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna calculate what our equity is after the value drops. So our equity is gonna be 10,000 um, which is our equity, and then we're gonna subtract the uh, drop in the value. Um, because when that value drops, we still owe the same amount of money uh, where we just now um, don't have our equity. So we're gonna take the value of the stock and then subtract 11,100 from that, which is what we're at uh, currently. And that leaves our equity at $1,100. The maintenance margin requirement is 25%. So we're gonna do 25% of the current stock's value, which is 11,100 times 0.25. So our current margin required is 27.75. So we would get margin called since our equity is below that. Um, so we would need to deposit the margin required minus our equity, and that's 16.75. Answer B. Question six, which of these correctly describes the numerator of the Sortino ratio? So I'm gonna pull in the Sortino ratio formula here, pretty straightforward. So in the numerator, which is what we're looking for, we've got the return of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate, and then denominator, we've got downside deviation. So this is um, what we're looking at here for this question. Um, so answer A, the difference between the portfolio return and the market return. So this is gonna be incorrect because of that market return, we're looking for risk-free rate. Uh, difference between portfolio return and minimum acceptable return. Uh, this sounds like it will be our answer. Minimum acceptable return is essentially another word for risk-free rate. Um, we're not gonna accept anything 
the risk free rate is the minimum we'll accept because uh, we're not taking any risk for that. So we wouldn't accept anything lower for the same amount of risk free rate, risk free uh, return. C, downside deviation as measured by the standard deviation of returns below target. That's going to be our denominator, not the numerator. So we'll rule that out. And then D, difference between portfolio return and benchmark return. Again, same as A, rule out uh, for that benchmark return there. Answer B, question seven. Matthew Jelkins, FRM, was recently found guilty of violating the principle of professional integrity and ethical conduct as outlined in the GARP Code of Conduct. Which of the following is a potential consequence? Jelkins will be A, required to participate in at least one ethical training workshop. Um, that's typically not going to be a punishment or something um, that the GARP Code of Conduct is going to lay down. B, stripped of the GARP member's right to use the FRM designation. That is certainly something they could do if the violation is uh, severe enough. C, stripped of the GARP member's right to work in the risk management profession. Um, GARP doesn't have authority over that. They don't determine who is employed or employable. Um, D, required to pay a fine whose amount will be determined by the GARP's penalty committee. Um, GARP doesn't issue fines either. So we will stick with B. Question eight, Jane Johnson, FRM, works as a full-time risk manager for the Washington Investment Banking Group. Recently, one of the Johnson's longtime friends asked her to help with preparations for an IPO, um, initial public offering IPO for a promising tech company based in Silicon Valley. This would be a part-time role and would entail establishing earnings projections for the tech company. Johnson should most likely so we've got some conflict of interest here. Um, it's a longtime friend um, that wants them to work on the IPO. Um, so that's the main conflict is the relationship there. Uh, so we've got A, accept the work as long as the Washington Investment Banking Group agrees to all the terms of engagement. Um, that seems uh, fine. As long as this is disclosed and her employer signs off on it, then it should be fine. Uh, B, accept the work as long as she does it in her free time. Um, even though it's done in her free time, she's still obligated to uh, get consent from her employer. Um, it doesn't really get rid of the conflict of interest there. C, accept the role as long as, in her own assessment, it does not interfere with her duties to the Washington Investment Banking Group. Again, you need employer consent. It's not going to be up to your own judgment here. Uh, and then D, not accept the work as it violates the code of conduct by creating a conflict of interest. Um, just because there's a conflict of interest doesn't mean it violates the code. It's more so about making sure you go through the proper steps to ensure that that uh, conflict of interest is disclosed and um, best um, taken care of for the engagement. So we'll stick with that here. Question nine. If the leading and lagged values of the mean, variance, and covariance of a time series do not change with time, the time series is said to be A, autocorrelated, um, we can rule that out right away. So when something's autocorrelated, that means that one, um, the variable in one time period is going to help predict the variable in the next time period um, and so forth. So there's correlation uh, between those uh, time series, um, which does not imply that they're not changing over time, just that they're correlated. Uh, B, autoregressive. So this is in, um, what we're going to use in a time series analysis to predict future um, outcomes. Um, so again, it's not really related to them not changing. So we can go ahead and rule that out. C, covariance stationarity. Um, that will be our answer. And you can kind of remember that right from the name, covariance stationary. It's staying in the same place, it's stationary. Um, it means that uh, these variables don't change with time. Um, and then D, auto covariant. Um, that is going to be um, let's see, I'm looking at the definition here. It's a tool for kind of looking at the uh, internal time series, kind of helping to identify patterns and dependencies over time, um, seeing how these are changing over time. Um, not, uh, again, not the key here is that do not change component. So we will stick with C, covariance stationary. Question 10. The trader uses a valuation model he developed to estimate the value of a bond portfolio at CAD 276 and some change million. The term structure is flat. Using the same model, he estimates that the value of the portfolio would increase to CAD 270, um, just shy of 279 million if all interest rates fell by 40 bips. 
and would increase to CAD 272.65 million if all interest rates rose by 40 bips. Using these estimates determine the effective duration of the bond. So the formula we're gonna be using here is relatively straightforward and we're given all the inputs. So in our numerator, we're gonna have the value of the bond when rates fall, um, which is given here, fall by 40 basis points. And this is gonna be our value we plug in right there. Um, so that's gonna go right there. And then for the increase, that's gonna be this value right here. So we'll plug that in uh, right there. Um, then in the denominator, we've got two times the value um, of the bond given at the current state, uh, which is a little over 276. And then when we're gonna multiply that by the change in basis points, um, which would be 40 basis points or 0 0.004 is what we'll plug in. Um, so here's just another uh, thing showing all those values and what we're gonna plug into that formula. And then here's what that math works out to, and we get a effective duration of about 2.85, um, which lines up right here with answer A.